I want to welcome everyone to the 17th annual Rawls Symposium for Undergraduate Research. This celebration of scholarship is a highlight of the college's academic year. Events like this are vitally important to students from all disciplines as they hone their skills of critical inquiry, problem solving, and communication. This forum shines a spotlight on important scholarship happening all across campus and the collaborative research of students and faculty. We owe a debt of gratitude to the late Dr. Joseph Edward Rawl, class of 1940, for his vision and encouragement to create this event in 1998. This event continues to serve as an important legacy to the Rawl family and North Central's ongoing commitment to undergraduate research. Dr. Rawl understood the importance of an academic forum as the ideal way to celebrate and share student scholarship. He actively participated in the symposium over the years, often bringing his colleagues from the National Institutes of Health and setting the precedent for inviting renowned scholars to give the keynote address. Today's keynote speaker, Dr. Satyan Devadas, class of 1993, certainly fits the description of a renowned scholar. Satyan grew up in Naperville, the son of our very own Dean Pandian, and because the apple didn't fall very far from the tree, he majored in mathematics, graduating summa cum laude, and exhibiting great judgment, also minored in physics. <laughs> he went on to complete his PhD in mathematics from the Johns Hopkins University. After postdoctoral work at the Ohio State University, he joined the faculty of Williams College, where he's a tenured professor of mathematics. He has received many awards, not only for his contributions to mathematics, but his contributions in teaching. The Henry L. Adler National Award honored young, honors young faculty whose teaching has been extraordinarily successful with influence beyond their own classrooms. He is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society and was honored here in 2008 with North Central's Alumni Recognition Award. Please read about his many other achievements in the program, but trust me, he hasn't forgotten how important his time at North Central College uh, was to his education and career as a distinguished professor and mathematician. I first met Satyan in Salem, Virginia in March of last year when both Williams College and North Central's men's basketball teams were in the final eight of the national tournament. That Satyan would travel with his whole family from Massachusetts down to Virginia to support his own school and to reconnect with North Central friends should tell you something about his character. Indeed, he also traveled yesterday from Stanford, where he's a visiting professor this year, along with his son Elias, to be with us here today. We are truly thankful. And while Satyan joined a group of faculty and students last night at our house for dinner, I'm sure Elias enjoyed an evening with his grandparents. I've enjoyed getting to know Satyan and I'm thrilled that he was able to join us. Satyan, thank you for sharing your talents with your alma mater and for sharing your insights in your presentation, The Shape of Nature, Bees, Trees, Origami. Dr. Devadas. Awfully kind of you. Thank you, my friends. It's great to be here. You know, I've never been in this hall before, so um, just a thrill. Thrilled to be back home. So let me tell you some of the struggles I'm having. I just want to share with you and give you a sense of encouragement. That's what this talk is about. One of the first things that many of you might have noticed is that since I'm a math professor, that might have caused you some stomach upset this morning, you know? <laughs> Dude, they got to listen to this guy with like 30 minutes talking about equations. Oh, we're going to get to equations, by the way, just to give you a heads up. Um, but one of the things I want to understand is there's this clear division today in our world as to how math works. You know, on one side, we have the, the kind and gentle art major who is sensitive, thinks about this world creatively, right? And if you actually think and talk to an art major, most of them would say, 
oh, I'm sorry, I don't do math. That's sort of the opposite end of the spectrum, right? In fact, we build our buildings that way, right? The, there's a science center, which is beautiful, which is actually important to work together with the sciences and, and physics and all these kind of uh, wonderful things. And, and then on the other side of the campus is the, is the art department, right? The opposite of art is, of course, math. And we see that this is not always the case. Like, look at Da Vinci. Look at what he did, right? Here are a couple of things that Da Vinci did that you guys know about. Here's Leonardo's stuff. There's the Mona Lisa, right? Clearly a work of art. It's probably the greatest artwork in the world today. If you've ever been to the Louvre and seen it, which I have, you see it about, you know, 100 yards away because it's all blocked off. And it's behind a glass this thick just to protect it from anything. And, uh, and so that's Da Vinci's work, an artist of an artist. But he also is a scientist, right? He's also somebody who actually cares about biology. He ripped people open, he studied animals, and he drew those animals and he drew those people as an artist. So if you actually look at his work of science, he's not just carrying a scientist hat, he's actually having an, an artist hat on him. And then at the same time, he's also an engineer. He cares about math, he cares about proportions and ratios and all of these possible things. So here's what Da Vinci was. He wasn't three different people wearing three different hats. He was one person where as an engineer, he thought of an artist. And as an artist, he thought of himself as a biologist. And as a biologist, he thought of himself as an engineer. Now, how can we get to that world today? That's my question for you. How can we get to that world where artists are working with mathematicians or working with computer scientists or working with linguists? How can we get to that world where you have people who are switching gears from one to another to another? And hopefully when I walk outside and see these beautiful posters and listen to your talks, hopefully as you guys do the same thing, you will start seeing the blending of ideas, that the ideas don't just end in your field. That if you're giving a talk about chemistry, it's not just about chemistry. It's about something else beyond it. And if you're talking about something in the humanities, something in languages, or something in art, that it's not just about that box. So how do we blend that world? Da Vinci did. He rocked the house, but he's one of these spectacular geniuses that existed in the world. How can we bring that world today, right? At North Central, or anywhere you go when you travel beyond these walls. Let's take a look at what it means to talk about math and art blended together. Here's some examples. If you ask art historians, if you ask people who are in the know and say, where does math and art fit together? Here are the examples they would give you. Piero della Francesca's work. Um, this is a work, if you actually notice, it's called The Flagellation of Christ. But if you notice the floor, it has this tiling and these grid lines coming into it. It's one of the first works of art that took perspective extremely seriously. And it took it all the way across the artwork. If you look at the top right, there's a bell tower. The shadows in the bell tower have a certain perspective that are exactly matched to the point of view of where the focus is going on the floors. In fact, my favorite part is the ceilings that you see of the inside of the intricate artwork, all of them, perfect perspective design. So here's the question, is this the intersection of math and art? Right. Is this where art and math fit together? Well, there's an example to think about. Here's something else, Marcel Duchamp. This is the new descending a staircase, right? Some of you guys might think, well, this is what? what does it have to do with math? Well, this is actually what Duchamp is trying to do. So he's trying to talk about four dimensions in three, right? You could see this movement of time and the woman walking down the staircase all captured at the same time. So he's trying to capture this higher dimensional work, the movement. You could actually see this woman is being layered on top of one another. In fact, the closest layer that's closest to you is the one closest in time and the one farthest from you the one furthest in time. And he's trying to capture the sense of dimension, the sense of movement in this artwork. This is another one, Salvador Dali. This is called uh, The Crucifixion. And here is Dali doing the following thing. If you take a box, just a cube that you get from Amazon, you know, like a shipping container, and you take a knife and you cut the cube open so you can lay it flat, so it's still one connected piece, it actually will look like a cross. Right, the four sides fold up, and then the fifth one flips open like this, right? It'll actually look like a Roman cross. And what Dali did was he took a four-dimensional cube, not the three-dimensional cube you get from Amazon. He took a four-dimensional cube, and he cut it open, and he laid it flat, right, in a three-dimensional world. So this is Dali struggling with higher dimensions, just like Duchamp struggled with higher dimensions in terms of movement of time. Dali struggled with it in terms of a physical box that's being unfolded. And, uh, and he actually has symbolic representations of Christ being crucified. There's the Virgin Mary, his, uh, his mother, looking at him. And he's saying, you know, this, this concept of dimension has something else to do with something bigger, maybe spirituality, maybe issues of faith. But even on the floor of Salvador Dali's work, you see a projection of that thing. 
And you see the unfolding of that 3D box. So here's a question. Is this the intersection of math and art? You know, are we getting close? This is the kind of thing we should be looking forward to. So here's Julie Mertu. She's one of my favorite artists. She won the MacArthur Genius Grant, which is uh, you get $500,000 from this organization just for being you. <laughs> That's right. No strings attached. If you want, as I would, you could buy a Lamborghini. And the reason I haven't got it is because I would buy a Lamborghini. <laughs> so, uh, but it's basically they give you this money so you can promote your work, you can think about it. You don't want to have restrictions to, to be bound in terms of where, you know, what you can do and who you can travel with, who you can work with. They just give you half a million dollars just to think about it. And Julie Merito won this thing, and this, is, uh, this artwork is called Stadia. So for her, this, if you actually look at this, this is, um, gosh, how big is this thing? It's, it's probably four times the size of the screen, is, uh, is the size of this artwork. It's enormous when you walk near it. It's o it overwhelms your senses. And it's called Stadia because if you actually stare at this just for a second, it looks like a stadium. Right? It looks like you're walking into this massive stadium. And uh, you see that uh, there are banners on the top. Right? You could sort of see something. There's movement in the bottom. Right? There's, there's specks that are floating around. And you don't know whether that's people, whether that's dust, whether it's symbolic of something. But, to me, this is the modern version of Duchamp, of a woman coming down that, that right, nude woman coming down that staircase of movement of space and time in this artwork. And this is in 2003 to 2007. So is this the intersection of math and art? And this is what artists today who are absolutely recognized to be cutting edge in this world are, uh, are trying to bring together. Now here's some, here's some other stuff that, uh, that we have that are familiar. Anish Kapoor's work, right? This is lovingly called The Bean. It's right here in Chicago. And, uh, and what's wonderful is, this, um, if you've ever been here, this, this thing is huge, right? You can actually walk under this, this little deformed bean. And as you walk under it, you see that all of space around you gets deformed, right? The way you look at the, at the lake shore, the way you look at the buildings around you are all warped based on how this, how this bean deforms reality around you. And that's exactly what Anish wanted to do. So, is this the intersection of, of math and art? You know, are you trying to talk about these movements in terms of how space itself is curved? Talking about issues of quantum field theory, string theory, the curvature of space and time of uh, Einstein's work. This is what we're trying to do. Here's something else, Rem Kulas. I'm not sure if you know this, but he's a, very, he's a world famous architect. And this is the CCTV building in Beijing. It is the central broadcasting tower of all of Chinese media propaganda, whatever word you want to fill in. But it is the national tower from which China sends out its images. And here's what they wanted to say, right? This is a torus. It's just a, it's a donut, right? It's a mathematical donut. And there's incredible beauty in terms of how it was built, but there's also these dark grid lines for structural integrity. But uh, what Rem Kulas is trying to say is the following thing, that, and this is what Beijing wanted, is that if you work at the top, at the very top, there's a way to just walk around that comes right at the bottom again. We are all one, right, in this Communist Party. There's nothing called top and bottom. You can go from the top to the bottom and the bottom to the top. We're just this one group. But it turns out that there are actually people who do work at the top. And, uh, and it is very different than working at the bottom, right? But, uh, but there's this theory behind it, right? Just get the feel. Just get the feel. That's, that's what it was. So is this some intersections of how math and art fit together, right? I mean, I, I pick math, you could pick any two disciplines you want. I pick math and art because those are things that excite me. But in, the, in society, they almost feel opposite, right? If you actually talk to somebody who have, has a degree in drawing or art or painting, they would say, oh, you know, I took calculus and that's where it ended. Or they'd say, I took trig and I never got past that. Right? Or you can actually talk to mathematicians, talk to people who love math, and they say, you know, what do you think of this? Can you draw something from me? Oh, pff, draw, I can't draw anything, man. Give me an equation. Right? And there, there's this whole polarity. And if we can bring those things together, we can probably bring a lot of other things together. So here's what we have so far. Right? This is what I think. This is my perspective on things. You, know, you have da Vinci, right? these beautiful works of art that you're trying to fit together, where the walls between math and art are blurred. And here's what we see so far between math and art. You see, math to me is influencing art. See, we do stuff, and the artists are like, that looks cool, I'll do that. But here's what I want. How does art influence math? In what way has new works of art come about that mathematicians look at it and say, that's amazing math that's in that stuff? See, so far what's happening is the following thing. We come up with beautiful ideas like the curvature of space and time. And then artist goes, oh, I can depict that visually. 
right? We can talk about the unfolding of four-dimensional polyhedra. And then an artist says, oh, that, that makes me think of uh, the crucifixion in terms of how some deeper thing happens. So mathematicians, to me, are doing a lot of the work, and artists are smooching off and getting a lot of credit. <laughs> See, if we really want to be the place of da Vinci, where there's no walls between math and art, where there's no walls between these disciplines of sciences and the humanities and all these things, then you have to take it seriously in which way is art really motivating and influencing math. That's the right question to ask. So let me tell you why that question is not successful. I don't think it's really the work of the artist that there's a stumbling block. I think it's actually the work of the mathematician that there's a stumbling block. The reason art isn't valued as much is not because the art is poor, but because the mathematicians don't see it that way. Let me give you an example. This is a quote by John Littlewood. There's a book by Littlewood and Hardy. These are two superstar mathematicians and number theorists at the turn of last century. And uh, here is what Littlewood writes about art. He says, a heavy warning used to be given that pictures are not rigorous. This has never had its bluff called and has permanently frightened its victims. You see, when we think of math, many of you think that equations must be there to have truth. Right? That's what truth is about, equations. And the moment you draw something, well, that's not really true. That's like a depiction. That's like a little pic. That's like a kid's stuff. Right? You can put in like a couple of pictures in a math book if you want to, but the real stuff, it happens in numbers and equations and formulas. And because we've been trained that way, we don't take art seriously. Because we've been trained that way, we don't take visualization seriously. Littlewood said it's the problem of mathematicians. So let me give you, I, this is a math talk, so I have to do this thing, but let me give you a theorem, right? This is the gauss bonnet theorem, my favorite theorem in the entire world. Here's what it says. And uh, let me explain to you what this means, right? The integral, that little integral sign, just means add up, right? So if you add up, k is the curvature. If you add up the curviness of every point on a surface, it's going to equal 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of a surface. All right, what does that mean? Let me pick a really simple surface for us to understand. Take a sphere, right? Just take a sphere. You know, there's a mathematical notion of what it means to be curvy, right? If imagine something is flat, it's zero curviness, and the sphere has some kind of curviness. So take a sphere, take any, every point on the sphere that has some measurement of curviness, add it all up. Just integrate, add it all up over the whole thing. And this formula says you will get 4 pi if you add it all up. Now, if I take the same sphere and I stretch it, so that you have different curvinesses at different points, and I put bumps in it, the total curvature is going to be 4 pi. No matter what you do to that sphere, it's always going to be 4 pi. You give it negative curvature, you give it flat curvature, it all is going to cancel out, and you're always going to get 4 pi. It's amazing. It's stunning, this result. Now, some of you are looking at this result, and a few of you are getting turned on. I understand. <laughs> But many of you agree with Stephen Colbert when he says equations are the devil sentences, right? <laughs> You're looking at that going, what am I doing at this talk? When do I get out, right? You see, we have this huge disparity because this equation is one of the most beautiful equations that depicts shape. And yet, we're turned off by it. So how do, we, how do we get to that world where we can bring these things together? Let me give you another concrete example. I want to show you again why it's so hard to fit math and art together. One example is because of this notion of what it means to value pictures over equations. Here's the second notion. Let me just give you this. These are four different four-dimensional polyhedra. You know, the two-dimensional polyhedra, the 2D versions, are polygons, like squares, rectangles, octagons, hexagons. Those are the 2D versions. The 3D versions are like cubes and dodecahedron and all these kind of things, right? So here are 4D versions. You just keep going up. There are other versions that keep existing, right? Now, these are 4D things that have been projected down into 3D world, right? So you can kind of see that stuff. Now, here is my claim. Right? I claim the following thing. All four of these things are identical, all right? Meaning that they're made of the same kind of stuff. The stuff might be squished a little bit and stretched a little bit, but the pieces of the puzzle that make all of them up are the same. So I take these Lego blocks, stretch them a little bit, and fit them in a different way, and you get another one. You take those guys, break it apart, fit it in a different way, you get those guys. So they're all the exact same thing. You're just looking at it from a different perspective. It's being stretched from a different perspective, but that's it. Now here's my question, my friends. What is the proof that they're all the same? What is the proof? What is the 100% mathematical guarantee that they're all the same? Here's what it is. Ready for this? That is the proof. 
You see, the picture is the proof. And the reason many of you don't believe it or don't even think that way is because you suck. <laughs> you see, you haven't been trained to actually value pictures that much, right? You haven't been trained to look at those pictures and say, of course, if I just, yeah, now I get it, right? Your mind isn't like that at all. Some of you might be trained if I said sine of x divided by cosine of x, right? You just, bzz, right? You're like, you're trained from like, do you remember like 11th grade? Like that's tangent, so I think, right? Or cotangent. You're remembering some of these equation manipulations, but we're not really good at moving visual pictures around. And the proof is you don't need anything else other than this. That's it, that is the proof. The proof is right here. It's visually in front of you because that is the intersection of these two worlds. That is how you fit them together again. All right, so what I wanna do today is give you a couple of snapshots of where I think math and art really do fit together. Where art and math are really pushing each other at the cutting edge. And I wanna give you a couple of things and all of these things are motivated by nature. I think nature has so much to tell us on how to do things right, how to do things well, how to do things quickly. So let me give you some examples. The first one has to do with stories about bees. Here's a question. It's called a 2D partition. Partition just means cut up. It's called a 2D partition problem. What is the most efficient way to partition, to cut up the plane into equal areas? All right, the plane just goes on forever, right? It's an infinite thing. And here's what I have to do. Here are the rules. First of all, I take a knife or I take a pencil. You cut the plane up into pieces so that two things have to happen. One, each piece that you cut up has to have the same area. Cool? That's the rule number one. Second rule is the pencil that I use to cut it up, it has to, I have to use it the least amount. I don't want to waste too much ink. So I'm trying to use the least amount of ink possible to cut the plane up into equal areas. So let's take a look. If I had to do this, here's my first shot, right? This is what I would do. Right? Cut it up. Do you guys believe it? each one is an equal area? They're all squares. Right? And the ink, it's not bad. I'm not waiting. I'm not like, you know, going crazy. Right? The ink looks pretty good, right? Clean lines. But if you stare at this just for one second, check this out, right? Look at that point right there. Do you guys see the amount of ink used right there? That's a lot of ink at that corner, right? Like, if you actually, like, zoom in, in the size of the square, it looks like the ink is fine. But right at that corner, it looks like there's a lot of ink concentrated. How much area is near that stuff? There's not that much area there. Right? I'm using a lot of ink for just that little bit of area. It feels like I'm wasting ink. Can I be more efficient than this? Right? And it turns out you can. Here's what you can do. You can tile it by hexagons. Right? Notice, do you guys see it's all the same area? Again, the same thing. And the ink, if you look at this corner, do you guys see only three things are coming together now? For the square, there were four things coming together. So I'm actually being more efficient because I have less ink at those corners. Instead of having four things of ink coming there, I only have three things of ink coming there. And here's the question. Can I do better than this? We knew that this was better than the squares, right? We could sit down. I could have show it to you. It's going to take me like, you know, two minutes. But is there anything better than the hexagon tiling of the plane? Here's a claim. Partitioning the plane into equal areas using regular hexagons is the best. This is called the honeycomb conjecture. All right, because that's what the shape of honeycombs look like and people think the following thing, that bees are really good, that nature is really good at being efficient. Right? Bees have done this so much that it knows how not to waste energy. And they think the bees, the reason they don't build boxes that look like squares is that's a waste of their energy to build those honeycombs, that these hexagons are actually better. Let me tell you something. It's called a conjecture. In math, conjecture means you don't know, right? You're just guessing. This problem is 2,000 years old, right? A Roman soldier, actually a Roman uh, general was writing to his wife. He was in the battlefield. And this is when the problem first started. He was writing to his wife and he said, oh, by the way, uh, take care of my property this way, make sure you manage it like this, you know, hire these people to, you know, take care of our, our real estate over here. And also look to the bees because they're really good at organizing stuff, like the way they take care of their honeycomb, right? It's like this little pathetic quote. And people are like, oh, sweet, this guy knows something. And that's all we had, right? That's our, that's our conjecture. So mathematicians have thought about this for 2,000 years and we can't prove it. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing how pathetic we know? Like we know so little, right? Okay, we know that the box, the squares, are bad and the hexagons are good, but we don't know if the hexagon is the best. We don't know if there's anything better than the hexagon. 
2,000 years old, and then it became the Honeycomb Theorem. 1999, Thomas Hales, professor at the University of Pittsburgh, just recently, right, just, just now, within about you know, 10, 15 years ago, proved this thing. Blew people away by this result. Unbelievable result, right? The Honeycomb Conjecture became the Honeycomb Theorem. Here's the question that you should ask. What happens in 3D? Right? Now, I've been talking about things on the plane. The, most, the reason people aren't that excited is because of the fact that most things don't happen on the plane. It was exciting for the re reason that we couldn't figure it out, but let's look at 3D. What is the most efficient way of cutting up space into equal volume? Same question as before, right? Except now your ink is actually sheets of paper you can trap. Right, to cut up space into equal volume. And you're trying to use the least amount of sheets of paper to capture things. So here is the notion that it comes from ether and foam. Now there's a, there was a time that people thought that the entire world was made of ether. Right? That's the only way light traveled, that's the only way objects you know, existed in, in dark matter and space and stuff. And, uh, and so people thought, well, what is the stuff that things are traveling through? It must be made up of something. So people thought it must be some object that's tiling this world. So this is the first attempt you would have. Right? Take cubes and tile the entire space. Now, check out that corner. Same thing again. Do you guys see the amount of ink that's needed at that corner? All those sheets of paper that needs to come together at that corner? That's a lot of ink. That's a lot of sheet of paper that you have to glue together to form that partition. It's a waste. Can you think of anything better than this thing? Notice it has equal volume. Each volume is the same. It's a perfect cube. But it feels like it's a lot of ink wasted again, right? Now here's the question. We know for 2D, the square didn't work out, but the hexagon did. In 3D, what is the version of the hexagon in 3D? What is the 3D hexagon? What does that even mean, right? People didn't know. They didn't even know what the tile should be. Do you guys see that? They didn't even know what it is that you should take to tile space. And then Lord Kelvin came along. Do you guys know who Lord Kelvin is? Kelvin temperature, absolute zero. Lord Kelvin comes along and he says, this is it. Right? And this thing, actually, if you think about it just for a second, if you actually use this, notice there are a bunch of hexagons there, which you would assume hexagons should play a role because they're important in 2D. And notice there are also squares there. If you actually take that, you could actually tile space with it. And this thing is called the Kelvin cell. And this is the tiling of space using Kelvin cell. And here's who Lord Kelvin was. When he spit on the floor, people studied his spit, for it was glorious. <laughs> there is nothing this man can do that was wrong. So if Lord Kelvin says, this is the answer, it is the answer. I right? just don't even, uh, or, Lord, could you give me the proof of that? There? No, no, the Lord doesn't give you the proof of that. Whatever, he just says it. That's it. So people were wondering, is this the right answer to this thing? Here's what it looks like from inside that world. This is what the world looks like from inside Kelvin's tiling. 125-year-old problem. It's called the Kelvin conjecture. And here's what it says. Partitioning spaces into equal volumes using Kelvin cells is the best. Here are some artworks based on this thing. This is Kuberta Kazuka's work. This is in uh, Brazil. It's actually in a very tough part of the neighborhood. On one side, it's extremely affluent. On the other side, it's extremely poor in this neighborhood. And he built this as a covering over this playground. And that covering that he built is actually tiled by the Kelvin cell. Here's what it looks like inside of it. It's actually gorgeous. Right? And some of the reasons I love it is because we don't know if this is the right answer. Right? This is at that time when he was doing this thing. It was the cutting edge work. So then comes this following construction. Let me just share with you how amazing this is. Ware Phelan. Dennis Ware is a professor. He has a PhD student named Robert Phelan. They were sitting around and they've been thinking about this Kelvin cell for a long time. And they remember the rules. The rules are the following thing. One, each thing has to have the same volume. And two, you have to use the least amount of ink or sheets of paper to do it. They remember those rules, right? But they said, but each thing has to have the same volume. But that doesn't mean each thing has to look the same. There's nowhere that it says each thing has to look pretty. Do you guys remember that thing? It just says each thing has to have the same volume. And it has to use the least amount of ink. So here's what they came up with. This is their object. Right? They came up with this thing that's made up of some dodecahedron that's kind of squished in some funny way. It has some weird hexagons in there. And they came up with this thing. And they said, this is probably going to beat Lord Kelvin's attempt. Right? Remember Lord Kelvin, his great tiling. What about this thing? Is this thing better? So they took this. And you can actually see it's called, uh, it's called the Ware Phelan's Piece. And they took it and they put it in a program called Ken Brake's Surface Evolver. 
And Ken Brockay was a professor who came up with a machine that you could just go type it in right now. It's free. Just download it. And you could just type it in and see what percentage your attempt is compared to anybody else's. And the moment Ken looked at this picture, he didn't even have to plug it in. The moment he looked at this picture, he knew that Lord Kelvin lost. He was just so into this world that he knew he lost. In fact, if you plug it in, you realize that this beats Kelvin's percentage of ink wasting by 0.5%. It. it beats it, but just barely. Here's what the world looks like if you tile it by where failing. So this is the new object of power. It's the best tiling we have so far. It's not as pretty as Lord Kelvin's, but it's better than Lord Kelvin's. And here's my question. Today, we still don't know if this is the best. We know it's better than Lord Kelvin. We have no idea if it's the best. But there's one hint that gives us that this is the best. I'll show you what that hint is. Here's what it is. This object shows up in this chemistry book. Now, what's interesting is Lord Kelvin's cell never shows up anywhere in nature. But remember the hexagon tiling that I showed you? Right? It showed up in nature. That's what bees do. But Lord Kelvin's thing never shows up in nature, which means that nature is probably not using it, which means it's probably not optimized. It's probably not the best because nature doesn't care. It could do something better. And this thing actually shows up in nature. It actually shows up in some set of hydrogen bonds. It's called the calc structure. It shows up in Arctic pipes, some frozen objects that show up in Arctic pipes. And here is where this chemical structure is in. The book is called The Nature of the Chemical Bond by Linus Pauling. Now, why do I care about this thing? I care about it for two reasons. One, Linus Pauling. Do you, I'm not sure if you guys know who Linus Pauling is. He won two Nobel Prizes, right? One in chemistry and one in peace. Another important thing is my middle name is Linus because my mom picked it for Linus Pauling. So uh, she is, uh, you know, she's a botanist, she's a biochemist, she loved Linus Pauling. She thought, all right, I'll pick Linus. So that's my middle name. And here's something else that's amazing. This book, The Nature of the Chemical Bond, is actually, remember Thomas Hales, the guy who proved the honeycomb conjecture? He had this book in his office, right behind where he was sitting on his desk. It's his dad's old book. And he had been working on this problem for years and years and years, and where Phelan beat him to it. But if he had just opened that book, just looked at that, he would have found it, and he would have won. So Thomas Hales solved that amazing problem, but he couldn't solve this one because he just didn't look in a chemistry book. It's amazing, which is sitting right there behind him. So let me show you where this thing shows up. This is a work by Tomas Serenko. This is uh, on the top of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is two pieces of a tiling of this where fail structure. You could actually get inside and walk inside this object, right? Really beautiful. And let me show you where else it comes in. This is the Beijing Aquatic Center. Do you guys know what that is? It's called the Water Cube by nickname. Remember Michael Phelps? He won like a thousand awards and he broke all of those records in here in this aquatic center. And here's what it looks like inside and here's what it looks like if you're swimming and you look up. The entire aquatic center is made by the wear fail structure. That's what they did. They built the entire wear fail structure and they gutted a part of it out and they built a pool. And the reason they did this is because the materials you need to build the aquatic center, you can use and make it into a square lattice or a cubicle lattice, but that's too much energy. So they thought, what is the least amount of material we need to have most structural rigidity? Wear fail in. That's the best we got so far. So that's what they did. It's an amazing thing of where math and art fit together. All right, so that's one shot. Something about bees, about giving us a hint of nature. Here's something else about trees. Right? Let me show you something about trees. This is, when I think of trees, here's what I think of, evolutionary tree, right? This is probably the best example of if we just care about our DNA structures, right? Just looking at our DNA and nothing else, we would say, here's how the world is arranged, right? Here we are animals, right? There we're next to fungi and plants, slime molds, right? That's our, the DNA is closest to that kind of stuff. And uh, here's what I think of a math tree as, right? It's just, it strips all that information, makes it the cleanest possible. There's the root, that's a mathematical root. Those are the leaves, that's where your species or your objects are that you want to study. And these are the internal branches. Those internal branches tell you evolutionary distance between objects, tells you how far and close things are. So let me give you a way of building spaces of trees. This is why mathematics is so exciting to me. This is something I really talk about. So this thing is a six by six matrix, it's just a box, right? And here's what it does. You can pick any six objects in the world and you can create a tree based on that, those six objects. Here are the six objects I wanna pick, ready? I'm gonna pick a chair, 
I'm gonna pick my glasses, I'm gonna pick the floor, I'm gonna pick the PowerPoint, I'm gonna pick a light, or you just randomly pick six things, right? And then you come up with a notion of distance between those six. So you say, the chair and the floor, they're pretty much the same kind of pathetic things, right? So the distance is like three. Right? That's how far they are from one another. But the floor to my glasses, these are amazing glasses. So that's like, you know, like 15, right? Because the distance is really far. But then from the floor to the light, that's maybe like seven. So you just make up your, just make it up, right? Whatever. From your hair to your friend, just look at your friend's hair, right? Look at hair patterns. Just make up some distance. And here are the only rules. The only rules are the distance between an object to itself has to be zero. Right? because it's not far at all, it's in fact right next to each other, and the distance from one object to the other has to be the same as the other object to the one. Right? So me to the floor is the same thing as the floor to me. Those are the only rules here. So you just come up with anything, it's called the dissimilarity matrix. You come up with a matrix that measures distances, and then here's what you do. You build, based on this genetic model, you could put it into a computer, it builds something that gives you this phylogenetic network. It just spits this out for you. And from there you can extract an underlying genetic tree, and from there, you can map this into a world and a space of all trees. So then you can study the space. This is why, to me, trees are exciting. This is the math model. But let me show you why this is really cool. Here's one of my favorite papers I've ever read. It came up in Nature. It's called The Phylogeny of the Canterbury Tales. And here's what they did. It's the same stuff I just told you about, taking a matrix, doing that work in the supercomputer. They took that idea. And these are professors from, I'm not sure if you can read this thing at all, Department of Biochemistry from Cambridge, and a couple of guys from the Humanities Research Institute. They got together, people who have nothing to do with the, what does a Humanities Research Institute guy has to do with a biochemist from Cambridge? And they got together and here's what they did. They said, I want to look at DNA structures of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Do you guys remember Chaucer's Canterbury Tales at all? Maybe you might have heard of it from high school, might have learned it in college here. Chaucer's is an amazing work of Canterbury Tales. There's something called The Wife of Bats Prologue. We have 60 copies of the manuscript, and each one of those things are different. And here's the question. Which one did Chaucer really write? We have 60 different ones. Each one is off just a little bit. So did this, is this the one that Chaucer wrote, and here's a scribe who's messing it up? Or here's the one that Chaucer wrote, and here's a scribe who's messing it up? We don't know which one the original was. So they took the manuscripts and literally wrote them out, the boy, T-H-E, space B-O-Y, and that was the DNA. The DNA was the manuscript itself, not the paper, not the ink, but actually the words. And they put it into a supercomputer, just like what I showed you, and they spit out this following tree. And here's what you notice. Everything on the outside rim, do you guys see all of those things colored differently? Those are the 60 different manuscripts on the outside. And it shows you how things are connected up together. Do you guys see all those things blues that are labeled CD? That means there's one error that happened from that central black dot, that one error that happened that was propagated to all of those blue ones. They all copied from one another. But there's this big error that was propagated. And then all of the green ones over there at the top, there's an error that propagated, and they became like brothers and sisters in this genetic background. And there's all the black ones the error got propagated. And here's the interesting thing. The red ones, which linguists never took seriously, the red ones are the ones that go right to the black dot in the middle. And so people think the red ones are the ones closest to Chaucer's work. It is the one that has not been polluted with some errors. So maybe the biochemists are telling us, you should go back and look at that work and look at it again and see, is that closest to Chaucer's? Use other linguistic tools. Let's talk about this thing together. So the ways of trees, my friends, I think trees are amazing. And there's so much you can do in almost any discipline with these things. Huge unsolved thing. So let me just close with my last thing, right, which is origami. This, I think, is a huge intersection of math and art. If you've ever gone and looked at pop-up books in Amazon or just gone to Barnes and Nobles and looked through those guys. It's amazing. It is an artwork. It is an amazing artwork. This is a work by uh, Robert Sabuda and Matt Reinhardt. Amazing, amazing, gorgeous stuff. But let me give you an example of origami. This is the James Webb Space Telescope. It's going to be launched in 2018 by, by NASA so far. This telescope is the size of a tennis court. And when it gets in space, it's going to crush Hubble. But there's a catch. How do you get a tennis court in space? <laughs> the reason Hubble works, it's the biggest sucker you could make that fits into a rocket. Right? That's what Hubble was. But we want something that's huge. And here's what they do. They built this thing so it folds into a rocket. You fold it too much, too many crease lines, 
and you have errors that you don't want to worry about. You fold it too little, it won't fit in. What's the right way of folding it? This is NASA's answer. So now we're using origami to take over the world in terms of understanding what space is. It's amazing. Here's something else. This is the Korobayashi stent. There's a student. She was, uh, she was doing residency in the East Coast. She was visiting her friend in Japan. Her friend was busy for a day. She, she just wandered around in, the Jap in, in Japan. And uh, I think she was in Kyoto in the Japanese Origami Museum. Just wasting time, right? She is a doctor. But she was just in the Origami Museum having fun. She looked at something in origami, and she came back. And her and her advisor came up with this stent. A stent is something you put inside your artery to open it up to let the blood flow, right? That's what a stent is. And here's what a stent should be. It should be small so you can put it inside. And it could be big so it can let the blood flow. So how do you do it so it's small and inside? And she thought origami folding. So this becomes this, right? Simply based on unfolding and folding. It's now $2 billion, their project, right? It's an amazing, amazing thing where origami is showing up. Here's something else, ferns unfolding, the way plants fold and unfold. Have you ever noticed in the springtime, like everything is green all of a sudden? Like it was just dry and miserable, and then in one week, like boom, everything is green. It wasn't the plants grew really fast, it's they've already had grown, but they had it curled up and folded, ready to go for the right time. You see, if the leaves come out too fast, then what's gonna happen when the plant is young is that the photosynthesis will kill it. And if the leaves come out too slow, then it doesn't have enough photosynthesis for it to grow. So what the plants do is they build their leaves and they have it curled up in origami folding. So when the right time comes, boom, the solar panels are ready to go. And how do the plants do this thing? What are the right kind of foldings they're doing? We don't really know. These are all cutting edge things. Here's something else, protein folding. The way your body folds proteins inside of you, which is doing tons and tons and tons of times a day, it's just a little stick that comes out and bends, and a little stick that, remember those, those straws that you can bend when you're a kid, right? That's exactly what a protein does, right? It's like tons of those straws that keeps bending. The catch is, if it bends incorrectly, you get mad cow disease, or you get Alzheimer's. And we don't know how they're folding. We don't know the theory of folding sticks. We don't know it. And if you can do that, then you might have an understanding of how to control Alzheimer's or mad cow disease. You can go back and look at these proteins, which are three-dimensional keys that go and lock inside enzymes and unlock your body in different ways, and you can say, whoa, that key is dangerous. I want to fix that key this way. We don't understand the theory of folding yet to do this. To me, this is an amazing intersection of math and nature. But let me show you math and art right here. This is Eric Demain's work. Eric Demain, 19-year-old professor. I take that back. He got his PhD at 19 years old. He became a professor at 19 years old when MIT hired him in computer science. MIT hired him, and, uh, and Eric got the dream job in the world, a tenure-track professor at MIT in the computer science department, which is one of the greatest departments there was, and, uh, and that works about Eric's stuff. And Eric turned to MIT and said, it's OK. It's cool. I don't want it. And MIT's like, dude, what do you want? This is the greatest job you could possibly get. What do you need? He goes, well, my dad's looking for a job. I'm not sure if you know this. That's how I got my dad a job here, personally. <laughs> um, but he said, my dad's looking for a job. And, uh, and he said, what does your dad do? And he goes, well, he's an artist. So MIT built his dad a glass blowing studio two floors from his office. Together, Eric and Martin, his dad, have written 350 papers. Eric won the MacArthur Genius Grant, the $500,000 that I told you about, when he was 25 years old. So MIT is not stupid in order to do this thing. They knew what was going on. And this, to me, these guys are the closest examples of modern day da Vinci. They think like this. They're just so creative in their ideas. So his dad just did this riff on ideas. And they say, yeah, let's think about this. And think, oh, that's a cool thing. Let's push. Let's stop. Let's go. It's amazing. And what this is, is a work of their origami sculpture that's in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And this is made from a flat piece of paper. And amazingly, there's this beautiful curvature that comes in. How do you get curvature from a flat piece of paper? We don't know. We sort of know some of these tricks and techniques, but what's the theory behind it? If you wanted to build a rocket that curves, can you do this thing? We don't know. Right? We're at the cutting edge. This, to me, is an intersection of math and art and science and nature. It is amazing. It's amazing. So let me just close with a couple of things. This is what we talked about so far, right? Where does math and art work? How does art and math work? How does it all fit together? Let me show you this. This is an unsolved problem. It's my favorite unsolved problem today. And to me, it is an intersection of math and art. The only way we're going to solve this is if artists work with mathematicians. 
This is the work of Albrecht Dürer. I'm not sure if you guys know this. I've seen this before. It's one of his most famous etchings. It's called Melancholia. And here's a question that Dürer asked. He said, OK, take a box that you get from Amazon. Right? That's what Dürer didn't use those words, but you know, I'm riffing on it. Right? Take a box that you get. Take a knife, and you can cut the box open only along the edges. That's the rule. All right? Cut the box open only along the edges so that you have to do the following thing. The box unfolds flat and has to be connected. Cool? So you can't like, cut the square off, and it has to unfold flat and be connected, but you can only cut along the edges. Can you do that for the square, for the cube? And we saw that. You could do that for the cube, right? We talked about this thing earlier. And can you do it for the soccer ball? And it turns out you can. Right? That's how it looked like if you do it for the soccer ball. There are lots of different ways of doing it. And Dürer came up with this question, 500-year-old question that we don't know how to solve yet in math today. Can you do this for every box imaginable? We don't know. Every box we try works, but we don't know why it's working. We can't figure it out. That would be a cutting edge world to do it in. You know, how did I get excited about all this stuff? You know, in terms of math and art, you know, where, where did that even come from? Let me show you something. This is my college, and there are two courses that I totally loved in this college, right, that sort of stood apart from the rest of it, right? I loved tons of things I took. Uh, but these two things sort of influenced me more than you would think. Here's the first one. There's the man, which Wilders, uh, in the audience today. He taught this course called Math, Music, and Art. Right? It's a book uh, that we went through for Godel, Escher, and Bach. But he really says, look, you know, when you're talking about these three worlds, there's no walls between them. A mathematician is basically doing what a musician's doing, basically doing what an artist is doing. And it's amazing to me. That course had a huge influence on me. The way Dr. Wilders taught it was great, too. And this, the second course I'm going to tell you is probably my all-time favorite course. This is, the, this is the class I talk about in dinner conversations when I try to look cool. You know, all that stuff. It's this class. It's a course by David Fisher, and it's called Aesthetics. Right? My favorite class ever, the philosophy of art. And let me tell you why this course was amazing. Right? The course was amazing because of the following thing. The first day of class, you know, Dr. Fisher asked us, what is art? Like, who says what art is? You know, can, can somebody spitting on the floor and hanging it on a frame in the MoMA, is that art? Is Mona Lisa, is that art? Like, what is art? And we all, the entire class, wanted to know what his answer was, right? Because he's the professor. He's thought about this thing. So we're like, tell us what art is. And he never told us. He never told us the first day, the second. And the last week of class, when we had to turn in our proposals, you know, after you've thought about these big issues and worked about small problems and you know, annoyed your parents, did the whole thing, we had to turn in our proposals. right? And we had to turn in what we thought art was. And at that time, Dr. Fisher turned to us and said, now I'm going to tell you what I think art is. And you know what I loved about the class? Nobody listened to him. Because we didn't care. Because we already had our answers. I would just turn that in, dude. I don't care what you had to say. I just found out what the right answer was. That, to me, was the best way to do it. Right? The guy's like, I'm ready to tell you. Don't care. Not interested. Right? And that, to me, was an amazing teacher. So that was the most influential class to me. So I hope you start to see, you know, when you think about these boxes of math and art and all these different things, that they actually fit together more than you would think. So let me close with this, uh, with this following work that I did with some of my students. So this is work at Williams College, right? This is the college I teach at right now. And it's just a picture on the left side of the picture. This is for about 16,000 alum at Williams, right? So on the left side of the picture are every possible major you can be, you could take at Williams College, right? Broken into 15 big groups. So there's something called culture studies. It's like anthropology, sociology, Asian studies, Africana studies. So we have these 15 big groups. And on the right side is every career you can be in the world today, broken again into 15 big groups. And we tracked what every alum did, what their major was, and what their career became. Right? And this is the picture that you get. So let me just show you an example. Right here, these are English majors at Williams College. Alum data going back from the 1930s. Right? That's the oldest we have so far. And look at the following thing. It almost breaks equally into every career possible. There's medicine in the bottom. There's a bunch of English majors going to medicine. Of course, there are bigger guys going there because they have more things down there. And the smaller ones have less things down there. But people going to law almost as equally as going to everything else. Right? This is history, breaking evenly into everywhere. There was a bigger chunk going into law, but that makes sense because you might be self-selective. But the bunch of historians who are majoring in history are going into medicine. They're going into higher education. They're going into arts and humanities at the very top. They're becoming actors who majored in history. This is econ. Now, bigger chunk goes into banking, which makes sense because they're self-selecting, but equally well going to all these other ones. There are a bunch of them going to doctors. And here's what I want to tell you guys. This is the other story, right? 
This is people who are in, where are they coming from? Where are they coming from? They're coming from everywhere going into these things. So what does it tell you? It tells you that your major doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. The moment you start thinking, I got trained as a math professor, I must be a math, and that's what I have to do, you're in trouble. See, that's what the whole point of college is, right? My favorite class was aesthetics, a class on philosophy of art. But I'm not an artist, but I love to think about that kind of stuff, and that's what I encourage you guys to do. When you're a chemist, or when you're a humanities major, when you're thinking about Africana studies, when you're thinking about languages, don't box yourself into thinking, now I have to be a professional linguist. Right? Of course you need a career, of course you need to think about what it is, but that's what the great thing about a liberal arts college is, that's why I love North Central. You can take these classes and see how it influences every other part of you. So I wanna close with this one slide. It's my favorite book, The Prince's Bride, and here's what it says. Life is pain. Anyone that says different is selling something. <laughs> you see, when you really want to reclaim Da Vinci, when you really wanna to go to a world where math and art fit together today, it is not gonna be easy, right? You have to work with artists and mathematicians and all these different people you don't like, and they think differently, and it's gonna be hard, but it is worth the journey. Thank you, my friends.